Okay, uh, hello everyone. So this is uh, lecture three uh, on uh, our series on index theory. Um, so the analytic aspects of index, uh, you remember, uh, we defined this uh, set of platform operators. So H is a Hilbert space. We define a set of platform operators uh, inside the set of all bounded linear operators on H. And um, so the first thing we want to see is that this uh, platform operators is actually open. So uh, this is open. Um, so the quickest way to see that this is open uh, is to use this uh, projection map. L of H to L of H mod K of H. Uh, so this uh, sometimes is denoted by C of H. So this is a closed two-sided ideal of compact operators inside this uh, system algebra L of H. So this is a sister algebra, at least a Banach algebra for us, right? So this is called Kalkin algebra, by the way. I maybe mentioned last time. Okay. So uh, you remember that uh, Atkinson's theorem said from last lecture, that uh, an operator is spread home if and only if uh, it's invertible modulo compact operators. So alternatively, then we can say Atkinson is, is saying the following thing, that fret home operators uh, is actually equal to pi inverse of the group of invertible operators here. So let me write it as C of H. So this is invertible operators, well, invertible elements of this um, algebra. Now, uh, we can uh, use a result which is independently of interest and it's extremely useful. And the result is the following. Uh, that uh, if A is a, so A is a unital Banach algebra, the unital Banach algebra, then uh, the group of invertible elements in this uh, unital Banach algebra is actually uh, open. A invertible. Uh, so this inside A is open. Uh, the only topology that we are discussing so far is norm topology. So there's nothing else uh, to discuss right now uh, for, for us at least. So this is open. Okay, so you can apply this result. Uh, well, by the way, proof of this is just uh, you can use a geometric uh, series argument. Uh, I just write it like this geometric series. Okay, uh, so then you can apply this result to this algebra, uh, Kalkin algebra. Uh, so this group of invertible elements in, inside this Banach algebra is, is open. Pi obviously is a continuous map. So pi inverse then is, is, is uh, its inverse image is open. So this immediately shows that uh, uh, Fred H uh, is, is open in norm topology. In uh, norm topology. Uh, 
But the thing is, uh, we can do much more. So, um, so being open is gives us some information, but we can do indeed uh, much more, and we have to do much more to understand these uh, platform operators. So the first step is to um, uh, focus on uh, FRED zero. So, so in general, uh, I, I can just say let FRED KH, so this is inside FRED H. So this is uh, FRED home operators of index K, okay? Uh, index K uh, FRED home operators. And so obviously K belongs to sort of all integers. And uh, we know something about FRED zero, right? So we proved uh, that um, an element, uh, an operator is a FRED home uh, operator of an index zero. So F belongs to FRED zero of H if and only if um, F is of the form S plus K, where S is equal to invertible, and K is compact. So we already know that uh, Fred, uh, index zero Fred home operators are exactly of the form invertibles plus compact. Okay, so this by itself shows that uh, FRED zero is, is open. So if you write FRED zero as a union of these uh, invertibles, Uh, invertible operators plus k's, where k moves in uh, changes in compact operators, right? Um, so uh, this is open by this result, and we just shift it by some k. So each individual set is open here, right? So we, we are taking unions of opens. So this is open then. Um, so. Index zero FRED home operators are open. But what we want to know is that actually uh, index K FRED home operators are also open. And even more than that, we want uh, to know more. So a nice way to kind of getting all these results in uh, one scoop is, is to use the following uh, lemma or proposition, I would say. Um, Proposition is that actually index index map from Fred Horn H to integers is continuous is a continuous map. Again, in norm topology, of course, right? So this is a very important result. So we want to show that uh, if, you, if you have a ferroton operator and uh, you perturb it a little bit uh, by any uh, bounded operator, um, um, because we know it's open, so we can, we can perturb it a little bit, uh, still uh, stay open, stay, uh, stay a ferroton, sorry then uh, the index doesn't change. So we want to, uh, we want to show that. Um, so to prove this, um, <clears throat> so that we can use the following trick. So um, proof. We can, we can uh, embed L of H into L of H to the some H. 
Um, um, so I think uh, maybe I should, maybe I better say Fred Holm of age. I don't need journal Fred Holm of age. Uh, inside Fred Holm of H to X on H. So uh, the map is like this, uh, taking a Fred Holm operator T, you just send it to uh, this diagonal operator T is star zero Z, right? So if you have a diagonal operator, which here is Fred Holm, here is also Fred Holm, the index of this obviously, if you examine the index of this diagonal operator, it's some of the two indices, right? So that's index of uh, T plus index of T star. But we already proved that index of T star is negative index of T, right? So this is zero, right? So no matter what you do, I mean, no matter what you take for T, any ferretone operator, the image is always going to be index zero ferretone operator, right? So we go to index zero ferretone operator. Okay, that's good. So now let uh, B be an operator of a small norm. It doesn't matter how small, I mean, just a small norm. Then uh, consider this operator um, plus P zero, zero, the star, right? So consider this operator now. So this operator, uh, it's close to E is star zero, zero, because the difference of the norm is norm of B, which we can, we can make it as close as we wish. We wish, right? So, um, and is obviously of the index zero operator, right? So, but let's let's see what what's the index of this guy. So, index of this is, is zero. So this is equal to index of e plus p minus index of, of plus rather index of t star so but index of t star is minus index of t so this is equal to index of plus p minus index of t okay so index of t plus p is equal to index of t is if b is small enough and that's continuity of index right because this is zero. So index of plus P if P is small enough. Uh, sorry, could you explain again why do you got that index of T plus B T star is zero? Uh, yes, uh, because uh, I mean, uh, this guy is close to uh, T T star zero zero, right? You agree that T plus P, T star is close to T, T star. Right. Right? And uh, so here then, because this T, T star is already in index zero Fredholm operators on H plus H, H mm -hmm. because this set is open, so it means that T plus P, T star is also uh, index zero, if P is small enough. Okay, okay. You're using index zero is open. Okay. Yeah, I'm using I'm using index zero is open, right? This one, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, but then uh, the index of t plus p t star is just index of t plus p plus index of t star, which is in general is true. Even if you have t and s here, it would be index of t plus index of s, right? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So everything okay. okay. I got it. Thanks. 
Very good, very good. Thank you. Okay, so uh, okay, so now this is all this beautiful because it has uh, some immediate applications. Uh, just uh, I mean consequences rather, I should say. Um, so it, it exactly tells us the connected components of uh, this set of Fairphone operators. Okay. So let me write it like this. A corollary is that um, the connected components of uh, Fred H are Fred A H. So, um, so, the, so we have this uh, decomposition of this open set into its connected components. So we have disjoint uh, decomposition into its uh, connected components. Uh, okay. Sorry, Fred H. Union K belongs to Z. Uh, Fred K H. Right. Ah, Masood, sorry, I had another silly question. No, no, that's fine. No, no, please. Yes. So B was an arbitrary operator in Fred H, right? Uh, no, B is just an arbitrary operator in 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 uh, bounded operators, which is of a small norm that we can choose. Uh, but why do you know T plus B belongs to Fred H? Well, because uh, because Fred H is open. We already proved uh, before that Fred H is open. Oh, you're using both Fred H and is open and Fred H zero is open. Okay, okay. Yes, for example, right, right, right. right. Okay. I'm using that result, right? Okay, thanks. Uh, there may be a way of avoiding using that result, but I don't know how to do it right now. But this is certainly certainly this idea works. Just how small B has to be uh, depends on this argument about openness of Fred zero later. Right. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So then uh, this image now uh, uh, emerges that we have these open sets. Here is Fred zero, and here is Fred one. So these are open sets. Okay. Uh, so these are so these are like islands in this uh, Fred H uh, thing open set. We have we have got the decomposition of Fred H into its connected components, and of course proof of this is is clear because uh, this uh, index is a continuous map into a set of integers, right? So the inverse image of any integer is going to be then as a result both open and closed. So each of these guys are both open and closed. So these are connected components, right? So the proof is that index from Fred to Z is continuous, implies that, because this is a discrete set, implies that Fred K, which is index inverse of this set K, is both open and closed. Is cloven. Okay, so these are connected components. Okay, so that. Sorry. Yes. Maybe a silly question, but how do we know the the Fred K are connected? Sorry. How do we know the Fred K are connected themselves? These are. Um. um How do we know that Fred K is are, are connected? These are both open and closed. Uh, isn't that enough to, to have that? I think if you take, for example, two connected components, their union is still open and closed because it's a finite union of open and closed oh. sets. Right, right, right. Okay, that, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a good question, right. So, um, no, no, that's a good point. So, um, now let me actually um, show that uh, you can connect 
any two things in fret k to um, yeah. So let let me let me let me give give a proof like that. Yeah, that that's a good point, right? Wait, can't you just argue that uh, suppose you had a path connecting something in Fred uh, zero to say something in Fred K, then because your map is continuous and it's a map to Z, it has to be locally constant and glo hence globally constant. Yes. Just work on paths yes. instead of entire yes. connected. I'm going to use that kind of argument actually, indeed, uh, an argument. So uh, let me first, um, uh, let me, let me, Maybe before uh, proving this completely, let me give uh, give another a, a corollary here. So this uh, let me put it like this. No. So imagine you have a continuous map. So alpha from zero one to Fred H, be a continuous family of Fred home operators, right? Then we know that the index at two ends uh, should be the same. So alpha zero, alpha one, and this curve, continuous curve alpha is totally inside fret homes. Then uh, the index of this, this operator has to be equal to index of that operator. And for the proof, I think that's what uh, Bruno was suggesting essentially. For the proof, we can just take index composed with this alpha, goes from zero one to, um, to Z, right? Well, this is continuous, this is continuous. So this whole thing is continuous. And because this guy is connected, so the image has to be just one point. It cannot be two points, right? So this is connected. I mean, this is basic topology that I may have forgotten all those details of basic uh, general topology, but <laughs> so this is connected implies that uh, uh, index of alpha is index composed with alpha is constant. So this is, this is very interesting as all right? If you have a continuous family of fretom operators, uh, the index does not change. Uh, now, um, you can take a fret home operator. So another consequence of this is that actually index is invariant under compact perturbations. So another corollary is that, I mean, the corollary of this node Yeah, so this is a strange way of putting things corollary of a note, but okay, so let it be. <laughs> okay, so corollary of this note is that uh, index is invariant under compact perturbations. So for any T belonging to Fred and for any K belonging to compact, index of uh, T plus K is equal to index of T. So we already know that T plus K is a Fred home operator. That's what we proved last lecture, right? Uh, the question is if it has the same index or not. 
Well, you can take the path, which is alpha t equal to t plus tk, right? So this is a path that interpolates between t and t plus k. And all these guys are Fred Horn, right? So that's it. It means that index of, uh, so let's take t between 1 and 0. So then uh, this implies that index of t is equal to index of the other end, which is t plus k. Okay. Okay, so um, now by, uh, by, well, I mean, so certainly we can say that uh, the set of index zero operators is connected. Let me, let me, uh, let me tell you why, because you can write, uh, so y at zero, is connected. Um, um, so, so we can we can we can do we can do the following. Um, if you have an element. Uh, if, if, you have, if you have an operator um, so so uh, take uh, take an element like uh, f1 you can write it as uh, as 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 uh, s1 plus k1 and then take an element like f2 you can write it as s2 plus k2 right so si belongs to um, to 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 invertibles right these are just uh, invertible operators so l of h and then ki belongs to compacts so um, I want to use a result that says that uh, the set of invertibles, uh, invertible operators is actually pass connected. So, so give me that result if you can. So, so what you can do is that uh, this is S1 plus K1. I just come with a pass from here to S1. You can just uh, stick a T like that, so come here. And then uh, from S2 plus K2, we can come to S2, and then I can connect up here by this result. So there is a path from S1 plus K1 to S2 plus K2. If we know that uh, L of H invertibles is a connected, uh, is past connected space, which we know it is. So we can do that. So perhaps we can do a similar argument for other components. Um, or maybe there is a simpler argument, but that's just escaping me right now. Any questions or comments? Okay, so um, Oh, what, what is left uh, from this sort of abstract uh, general index theory before uh, we uh, move to uh, kind of examples and then uh, <clears throat> a tier single index theory is um, there is one result which uh, one can prove using this, this sort of results. Uh, that's uh, the additivity of index. Uh, so, all 
All right, so um, this is a proposition. Um, for F1, F2 belonging to uh, Fred, we know that the product is a Fred home operator again, right? We have index of, but what we want to show is that index of F1 plus F2 is equal to index of F1 plus index of F2. Uh, you mean product, not sum, right? Sorry? Index F1 times F2. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you. F1, F2 is equal to index of F1 plus F2. So in other words, index acts like a log, like a logarithm. Um, so uh, in my first lecture, I said that this is a purely algebraic result. And one can indeed prove it just using algebra, just using this idea of Euler characteristic of complexes, and you can, can prove it. I, I kind of sketched and showed the proof along those lines. But uh, because here we are in this analytic situation, one can use this, this homotopy invariance of index and uh, give a different proof, which, which is interesting. So this proof only works on, in this Hilbert space or maybe Bonnach space context. It doesn't work in, in the purely algebraic context, but the result is purely pure algebra. But it still is interesting to see this proof. So proof, uh, so use homotopy invariance. I just put it like this, homotopy invariance of index. In other words, um, we know that index of uh, F1, F2, is equal to index of this operator, F1, F2, 0, 0, identity, right? So we are using, again, this doubling uh, trick, OK? So index of F1, F2 is equal to index of F1, F2, 0, 0, identity. Because index of identity is 0, so index of F1, F2 is just 0. And on the other hand, index of F1, plus index of F2 is uh, index of this operator now, index of F1, 0, 0, F2. This is uh, I already used in uh, previous result, in pre previous theorem, right? This is F1, F2, 0, 0. OK, so then uh, all we have to do is to find a path connecting F1, F2 identity to F1 and F2. So that's the idea now. So so the biases find a continuous continuous path from one F two zero zero identity to F one zero zero F two because uh, well I mean a continuous path of uh, fret holes of course of uh, frets. You can find a continuous path between any two operators. That's uh, cheap. <laughs> you haven't done much if you do that, right? Uh, but uh, what we want is a continuous path in the world of fractal operators connecting uh, this guy to this guy. So um, how we are going uh, to do it, um, Basically, the pass is, is, is not a difficult pass. It's a pass that switches the role of the two coordinates. Uh, that's, that's going to be, if, if we switch, we can just um, um, 
move. Um, so let me. So how, what's the what's the best way to explain this now? Um, okay. So um, right. Um, Oh, right, so the, the path that we take is this. And so let alpha of t, also oh, this one is f1, zero, zero identity. Ah, oh, yeah, so we do uh, the same for the second one, f2. Zero, zero identity. You see, if you don't do nothing and multiply these two, you're going to get F1, F2 identity, right? So at one end of the path is going to be, uh, what we do is going to be F1, F2 identity. Now I'm going to, if I, if I manage to exchange the two coordinates, then I can, this, I can push I up and F2 down, right? By doing that, at the other end, I'm going to get F1, F2 on the diagonal. And to do this rotation, uh, so, uh, so let me write it here like this. Two, zero, zero, identity. To do the rotation, we just uh, use the rotation operator. Here I put, uh, Cosine of pi over two, t sine of. So let me let me put it like this. Here goes cosine of pi over two t sine of pi over two t minus sine of pi over two t cosine of pi over two t. Here, and here goes. Um, the inverse of this operator. Okay, so uh, so well. Okay, so here goes cosine of pi over two t minus sine of pi over two t uh, sine of pi over two t uh, cosine of pi over two. Okay. So this make two by two matrix goes here, and this two by two matrix goes. By two by two matrix, of course, we mean two by two matrix of operators, right? Each of them is multiplied by identity and the maps. Uh, all of these are multiplied. Okay, so now this operator at one end is going to, uh, at, at t equal to zero, is going to be to give us uh, f1, f2, zero, zero. And at the other end, if you do the calculation, uh, exactly because of this rotation, you're going to get F1, 0, 0. Um, at the other end, you're going to get, if, if, t is, if t is equal to 1, you're going to get 0, 1, minus 1, 0, and then, uh, yeah, here is 0, minus 1. And you multiply, you're going to get the switch between the two coordinates. So that's a very nice uh, trick. Uh, I think this, is, this goes back to origins of K-theory and index theory, and uh, a lot of people used it again and again. Okay. So this is one of those uh, two by two matrix tricks uh, in the subject. Okay, so that's very good. Um, I think we are just uh, about uh, done with uh, abstract analytic index uh, properties. Uh, so, Uh, 
so uh, well, final remark here is the beginning of a lot of uh, new stuff now. Okay, so um, we have this uh, Fred H. Now we have this decomposition as unions of Fred KH. Okay, so, so these are open and uh, the, at least uh, the Z, for K equal to zero, I showed that this is connected, um, but these are all uh, connected components. Uh, other components are also connected. So we have this decomposition. So that's the first step in understanding uh, topology of Fred H. So that's uh, now very, very important to understand. So the topology of Fred H. So the first thing that uh, we, we realize is it's pi zero. So we just discovered that pi zero of Fred H is Z. The set of connected components, in fact, past components in this case, because that's an open set uh, in, in, in a normal space. That's, uh, so it's set of uh, its past components is uh, Z and the isomorphism is implemented by index. Right, so this sends f to index of f. So class of uh, this guy operator in this set goes to index. This is an isomorphism. Uh, so Masood, for an arbitrary Hilbert space, yes. Uh, why do we know that all of them are non-empty? Oh, for an arbitrary Hilbert space, so, okay, so, uh, in fact, for finite dimensional Hilbert space, they are empty. Right, right, exactly. There is, there's nothing beyond index zero, right? That's what we discussed in the first lecture. Right. Uh, and, but that's not an interesting case. I said in the, in the very first lecture that uh, really uh, the case where one of these guys is finite dimensional is not interesting. So the case that's interesting is that the domain and target space are both uh, infinite dimensional. Okay. Right, but even if they're infinite dimensional, not all of them will be non-empty, no? Some uh, of them must be empty. No, no, all of them are, uh, are, are non-empty in the infinite dimensional case, but then the example that I gave, uh, I discussed it in this case, uh, works. We can just take an orthonormal basis. Imagine it's, uh, it's, its dimension is uh, countable, okay? Mm -hmm. So you just take an orthonormal basis EI, uh, E0, E1, and then just uh, look at forward shift and backward shift operators. Then you oh. get all operators. Okay, got it. Of different index, right? So abstractly, we know that, yeah, that's a good question. We know that all these components are non-empty. Uh, and even if uh, your space is dimension, this Hilbert dimension is bigger than Aleph naught, that's okay. You can just uh, take some countable basis, E0, E1, and then on the orthogonal complement, uh, we don't care. We just take it identity on the orthogonal complement to that countable uh, number of bases. And on the countable number of bases, we just repeat this uh, forward shift, backward shift argument. So this, uh, so indeed, yeah, so um, if dimension of H equal to infinite, and this infinite doesn't have to be countable infinity. And this is Hilbert dimension, by the way. So this implies that for K, H is different from uh, empty for all K. So, Pranav, is it, is it okay? Or do you have a question about this? Or? No, no, got it, thank you. Okay, so that's, uh, so I guess I wrote down this uh, shift operator, but I'm gonna write it again because we're gonna use it soon. So that's, uh, okay, very good. So this is, uh, okay. So like any other topological space, of course, knowing pi zero is the first step. It's the zero to step in understanding the topology, algebraic topology of that space, right? So now we have the pi, we know pi zero, but the question is what is pi one, what is pi two, and so on and so forth. And uh, what are the cohomologies of this space? What are the homologies of this space? So these are very interesting and important questions. Um, so let me just, um, 
write it down now. Um, so the question now, so first of all, um, let me mention this, uh, although I won't prove it now, but let me mention that the different components, uh, I'm not sure if they are homeomorphic or not, but they have the same homotopy type. This is uh, true. So, uh, same homotopy type. I think by homotopy type, I mean um, one can write maps even between the two that implements isomorphisms in, in homotopy groups in all dimensions. I think this is true, but I won't prove it now. So that's- No, but this is a topological group now, no? With multiplication being the group. Oh, no, <laughs> right. It would be wonderful if that was the case, but it's not, right? So um, Fred is not a topological group. It's not a group, in fact. Oh, inverse, sorry, yeah, of course. The inverse is missing. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. It's a kind of interesting object. It's, it's, it's a semi-group. I, I guess it's called semi-group, right? It has a unit and it's closed under multiplication. So it, it, it's a semi-group. And indeed, the, the semi-group property uh, implies some something about this topology, I believe. but. Not like group uh, case, which is uh, very straightforward, but uh, you can you can translate back and forth, right? Uh, not not like that, but I think it, I think uh, you can z you can use this pi zero is z to switch between to move between different uh, components. Uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking. So if for each yes, yes. yeah for each Fred k is non-empty. So we can just multiply the identity component with that Fred K and land up in that component and that will give us a homeomorphism between components, no? Well, well it's not a homeomorphism, you see, because uh, I can no inverse. Sorry? Okay. You're saying there's no backward map, there's no there's inverse. No, there's no inverse, right. But up to homotopy, maybe it's, uh, it is, because uh, I, if I multiply by its inverse, then uh, the inverse is going to be T star, and uh, indeed, uh, TT star has index zero, so, and that space is connected. So I believe that this idea of sh multiplying by- Right. Okay, yep. it should, homotopy. Should, yeah, should, it should imply homotopy equivalence of different components. Absolutely, yeah, correct. Not, yeah. not homeomorphism, but homotopy equivalence. Correct, correct. So I, I think it would, imp it would in induce a, and isomorphism on homotopy groups, but uh, I'm not uh, writing it uh, very, uh, I, I don't want to write the proof because, yeah, we can discuss it later. But uh, the, the idea is along these lines, yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's the first step. But so we can focus on Fred zero now. So Fred zero of H, um, and one, and I, we can look at what is pi one. So, so then what is pi k of this now? Well, I mean, you have to, you have to, you have to fix a, you have to fix a pace, right? In order to talk, talk about pi k or pi one, whatever. So what is pi k of Fred zero of H based at one? And uh, similarly, you can ask what is cohomology of this space? These are, these are important questions for uh, index theory analysis. Uh, so what is HK, for example, or maybe HK cohomology? Is equal to what? I believe uh, this is known. Uh, definitely, I will mention this later on. It depends on parity of K. It could be zero or z, depending on uh, parity of k. If k is odd, I believe it uh, is zero. If k is even, it's z. Uh, we can, uh, I, I will mention this uh, later on, but uh, it's, it's a delicate question. One has to be uh, careful. So, but, is this something like bot periodicity or something like that? Uh, not exactly, not exa but it's not unrelated. I mean, indeed, um, 
it behaves like that because, as I will mention, uh, this actually is a classifying space for K theory. And those, uh, you know, stable unitary groups are also classifying space for K theory. Okay. And pi K of a stable unitary groups to be like that, satisfying both periodicity, is uh, related to, to this. But uh, um, just using both periodicity, I don't know how to drive this fact, but uh, they are related. So we will, we will discuss it soon, actually. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discuss it soon. Okay, so this question is something that uh, we should keep in mind, but uh, um, okay. Any other questions uh, or comments about uh, this so far? Okay, so I think um, we are basically done with uh, abstract analytic index theory. So, so this is basically end of um, functional analysis, so so to speak. <laughs> well, we are going to use functional analysis always, but uh, aspects of uh, Fred and index. Um, Okay, so uh, now let's go to our uh, promised question, which was this uh, baby index theorem that uh, for toplitz operators that I said that is going to justify uh, this theory. And the first, this was the first index theorem, by the way. So, the uh, very first index theorem. So this is index of uh, toplitz operators. Um, okay, so let us recall from the first lecture that we define the map, uh, so T, uh, from uh, say actually from an infinity of this one to uh, bounded operators on H two. So remember this. What is this H two? So H two is the hardest space. This is a closed subspace of L two of this one. Uh, so you can define it in uh, different ways. We define it in different ways. So one way would be to say, okay, this is the set of all functions, uh, L2 functions, whose uh, Fourier coefficients in negative degrees are zero, right? So the set of all F belonging to L2 of S1 such that the Fourier coefficients uh, F in negative degrees is zero for all N less than zero. Um, related to this, we can define it in a different way. We can say um, this is also a spectral projection. Onto a positive eigenspace. The operator, so actually there's a differential operator um, D, which is equal to one over I D dx. Um, so there is a natural domain for this, which is C infinity of S1 to C infinity of S1. Okay. It's just differential operators, right? So if you look at this differential operator, I mean, this derivative operator from smooth functions, doubly, I mean, sorry, periodic functions to periodic functions, um, the 
eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of this, we know what they are. They are e to the i and x. These are basic uh, Fourier. Um, I mean, basic uh, periodic functions, right? In other words, what I'm saying is that one over i e to the x of e to the i and x is equal to um, n e to the i and x, right? And belongs to z. Okay, so what this uh, says is that H2 is projecting onto the positive eigenspace. So H2 is equal to projection into um, the positive eigenspace. But C infinity S1 is not a Hilbert space, no? No, it's not. It's not. But indeed, um, I'm just uh, using this differential operator. This is a dense uh, subspace, uh, linear subspace of your Hilbert space, right? Right. And uh, I'm just using it to define a, a set of functions. Mm -hmm. And then I say, okay, take the linear span of those and close it up. And okay. then you do get uh, this space, exactly this space. So okay. looking at it like this, uh, it's not like doing much, but the reason I'm writing it like this is that very soon I'm going to define some Dirac operators, which is going to be uh, examples of first order differential operators that we can apply index theory to. Sure. So that would, that would give us a kind of launching a uh, point to, to kind of more general things. So this uh, is, uh, okay, anyhow. So if you think of hard space this way or that way, uh, we can define this map T in the following form. So T F, so T basically, so let me write it like this. T sends F to T F which is equal to P MF P. So what is MF? MF is multiplication operator multi. by um, F, right? And P of course is this projection. So this TF is called the Toplitz operator um, defined by F. And of course, norm of TF less than equal to norm infinity of F. So this is easy to check. I mean, you can just see it here. If you take a norm of this guy, norm of P, uh, this is product of three operators. Norm of P is equal to one norm of ff is equal to norm of f and this one. So this, you have at least this inequality that uh, norm of tf is supnorm is bounded by supnorm of f. Okay, so this, this we know for any f in L infinity of s1. Um, okay, so this is called the Toplitz operator defined by f. Okay, so Maybe I didn't write anywhere, but uh, this TF is the Toplitz operator defined by F. Okay, so th there is a relation between these guys and um, Toplitz matrices. So let me write it down, which is um, kind of interesting. So we can take an orthonormal basis that n, n bigger than equal to zero for uh, H2, right? 
because these are exactly those functions, uh, or these are e to the i and thetas that, or i and x that I wrote down over there, right? So I, now I'm writing it like this, so it doesn't matter. So if you look at these guys as um, an orthonormal basis for H2, then uh, if your function f has the following, following Fourier expansion, which is sum uh, f hat n e to the i and x and belongs to z, which is you can also write it as n in z f hat n z n, so in this form. If your function is like that, then the matrix of T, uh, Tf, you can easily check, actually we checked some, some aspects of it, check that the matrix of Tf in this basis is going to be the following matrix. So on the, on the, on the main diagonal, there's going to be this A0. Um, so this, this let, let me call this A n. So this is a zero, a zero, so on. On the uh, above the main diagonal, are going to be a minus one, a minus one, a minus one, so on, and then a minus two, a minus two, so on. And below, there's going to be a one, the positive coefficients of a, a one, a two, a three, so on. Okay. So there we go. On each diagonal, the values of the matrix is constant. And such matrices, uh, even in the finite case, they are called toplitz matrices, right? Of course, in this case, it's an infinite toplitz matrix. So they, 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 they are uh, kind of nice structured matrix. Uh, they, they have some. Uh, very, very deep, important properties. But uh, right now, we just look at uh, this aspect. Uh, okay, now, this map is actually interesting uh, from uh, other points of view. Let me write it down. So this map F, so we have a map from an infinity of S1 now to um, bounded operators on some Hilbert space. It's not uh, L2 of S1, it's H2 on, on a different Hilbert space, right? It's on a part of this Hilbert space. So uh, sending F to TF. So obviously this map is a linear map, right? T of F plus T is equal to T because just in the definition, everything is just linear, right? So this is a linear map. Um, but it's not multiplicative. Yeah, so I mean, it is not true that T of F T G is, uh, I mean, in general, it's different from T F uh, G. And the reason is that um, if you multiply two such things, multiplication operator and this projection operator, they behave badly uh, with respect to each other. They are not going to commute, so you cannot. Um, so, but these sort of maps that send uh, a function on some space into operators, you can think very, very generally, I mean, as, as some sort of quantization maps right now. Uh, without uh, having any physics in mind, uh, just the idea of quantization is is kind of starts to show here. So we have a, we have a function on some space, turn it into an, an operator TF on, on some Hilbert space. Uh, so this is a kind of quantization map. Um, so. F is a quantization, but I'm not um, saying more right now. Uh, 
But the idea of quantization is here, that you turn functions, commutative elements, into operators, which are, in general, don't have to commute to each other, right? So that's... Uh, okay, so I mean, this is uh, just to start, but um, what we want to show is the following. We want to show that actually, um, um, although they are not equal, but the difference between the two sides is rather small. The difference is compact, actually. So it tries to be equal to left hand side, tries to be equal to right hand side, uh, but it fails, but fails in not in such a bad way. The, the, the difference is going to be small. So let me write it down and prove it. So uh, this is the lemma. Now for this lemma, I'm going to assume f and g are, are continuous functions. For any f and g belonging to c of s1, tf, g minus t f g belongs to compact operators. Okay. So for any two continuous functions, the difference is rather small uh, in the sense of uh, being uh, element of compact operators. So to prove this, uh, we can uh, just Um, we can use an approximation argument. So to prove it, uh, you can just uh, prove it first for f equal to zn. For all g and for f equal to zn. How we can prove it? Well, in this case, you can actually analyze this operator and you see that you can actually show that TFTG, T, uh, ZN, TG minus TG, um, uh, ZN. In this case, is actually a finite rank operator. It, it projects into the first two n components from minus n to n, something like that. Right? Uh, in this case, one can, in fact, it's not difficult. Uh, we did something similar to that in the first lecture. Anyhow, one can directly show that. It is a compact operator. Um, yeah, it is a finite rank operator. Okay, so this is a finite rank operator. Um, okay, then what we can do, we can. Uh, Oh, so uh, maybe I'm, 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 I'm confusing something here. Sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. No, 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 I, I should not, uh, I'm, I'm going too fast, sorry. Um, okay, so yes, we want to prove that this is incompact, but now the idea of proof is uh, first, uh, so first, sorry, <laughs> I have to erase this part. The, 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 the issue is really the commutation between this projection operator and uh, this uh, multiplication operator, right? First, show that uh, P and F minus uh, MFP uh, 
is compact. For all f belonging uh, c of s one, okay. Uh, to this end, yeah, we can first prove it for f of z equal to z n. Uh, in that case, is actually a finite rank operator, in which case uh, PMF, MZN rather, minus MZN, E is finite rank. This you can directly check using uh, shift uh, backward forward shifts, it's finite rank. And then in general, we can approximate uniformly uh, this F by finite sums of such trigonometric uh, things, right? And in general, approximate F uniformly by finite sums. For such things, and because the result is true for each set, then is, is the result is true for each of these. And okay, so once you can approximate f by such things, we know that uh, compact operators, in indeed, is the limit of finite rank operators. So you have to you have produce some operator which is going to be limits of um, a finite rank operator. So it's compact. So compactness as a result. Compactness of this uh, commutator is guaranteed. Okay. Okay. Once uh, you have the compactness of this, then I can prove the compactness of uh, this uh, difference now. That's not difficult. So let me write it down. Uh, so this is end of the proof of this lemma. So finally. Um, so we can just write TFTG minus TFG as, well, just write this uh, TF is PMF um, uh, P and then PMG P minus PMFG P, right? So now we can just, um, of course, p squared is p. And then I can use this compactness result to switch the orders here. So this is p times, I can just write mfp minus pmf plus pmf and then times mg times p. And there is minus. MFG P. So that's equal to P. Now we know that this uh, commutator is compact, right? So I just put a compact here um, times, so it's compact plus P MF uh, times uh, MG P minus P MFG P. Now this is equal to P. K and G P and this part is plus okay again P squared is P so this is P M F M G P minus P M F G P. Okay. Of course. MFMG is equal to MFG because uh, multiplication operators is uh, they commute, they don't do any offending things, right? So this cancels with this part. And we know that compact operators form a form a two-sided ideal. So you have got this operator multiplied by compact multiplied on the back. So this whole thing is compact. So this belongs to compact. 
if you pre-multiply or post-multiply a compact operator by any operator, you're going to get compact. This is okay. Uh, wait. Uh, so the definition of TF was PMF, right? Um, yeah, PMF. But I can put a I can put a P here. So this means that um, I can actually think of this uh, TF as um, acting. Um, yeah, yeah, but that, okay. So it, it doesn't matter if I put a P there because a P on on H two is identity, right? So it just. Um, no, but if you put P on the right, how does P act on L infinity S1? P on L infinity S1? Sorry? No, because in your, in your calculation on the right, you have written TF as P, M, F, P, correct? Uh, where? Here? Or no, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You have written P, M, F, P. Yes, right, right, right. As definition of TF. Right. But TF goes from L infinity S1 to L2, L of H2. That's right. But P, um, uh, it also acts on H2. Because no, H but if you write it like that, P should have acted on L infinity S1, no? It's taking as input. No. Like if you have. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, L infinity S1 has gone out of the picture. These are operators on either L2 of S1 or on H2. These are operators on Hilbert space now. L infinity of S1 uh, was the original Toplitz map, or maybe the notation oh. is a bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know the notation is a bit uh, awkward, I agree. I mean, I, I go from L infinity of S1 to, to bounded operators, on H2, but then TF is really an operator on L of H2 for any. Okay. Okay. So you should think of F and G as fixed here now. Okay, and now you are just restricting the TF to uh, to L of H. No, wait, what? What does PMFP mean? I'm not understanding. Yeah, this um, PMFP uh, really goes, PMFP goes from H2 to H2. This part you can think of as doing nothing because on H2, this is identity, this is projection onto H2, so it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. Uh, that's oh. MF goes from H2 to H2. This is, um, well, I mean, MF um, really um, multiplication operator, I mean, um, doesn't matter, but then you're projecting down into H2 again. So MF doesn't go from H2 to H2, MF goes from H to H. Is that clear? So you're sort of computing TF, TG minus TF, G when restricted to H2. Is that correct to say? Yes, yes, yes. yes. All my operators, uh, these, these operators TFs, are really on H2. Okay. The topless operators are on the Hardy space. Yes, exactly. Okay. Which you obtained uh, by saying this is this linear span completion of this ZNs and positive or positive eigenspace of this Dirac operator. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so now uh, why we are doing this, uh, so end of this level, well, the reason is that I, I want now to show that actually um, this TF is a fretholm operator if F is invertible, right? So that's the, that's the uh, goal now, because this is not obvious. So proposition TF is spread hold for all F belonging to C of S1 such that uh, F of Z is different from zero for all Z belonging to S1. 
So in other words, for invertible elements of continuous functions on the circle, the stopless operator is threshold. Okay. So proof. Okay, so just as an aside, it's, I'm not gonna use this fact in the proof, but remember in the first lecture, or actually right now using that toplitz matrix, uh, we can immediately check that this, uh, this is the, the case for f of z uh, proof. Um, by the way, I mean, I'm saying that uh, this is immediate, more or less, for f of z, equal to Zn for all n belonging to Z. Because in this case, you get a forward shift or backward shift operator. I get forward shift or backward shift. Or basically, you get a shift operator. Let me write it like this, get a shift operator. Okay, so in this case, I mean, so for f of z equal to zn, the, the statement is not uh, difficult to prove. You can prove it by bare hands. But for general f, a continuous function, only thing we know is that it's invertible. That's not uh, an easy thing to do. I mean, if you look at the matrix of this f, the topless matrix that I, I had here, why that matrix, if the function is uh, invertible, why that matrix should be Fredholm? I mean, what's the relation between these coefficients and being invertible, first of all, and what's the relation between those coefficients and being uh, Fredholm? So that's, a, that's quite a mysterious, uh, strange thing. But now uh, we can give a general proof in this case. So uh, in fact, I can just write TF uh, T F inverse minus T of F F inverse belongs to compound operators, right? So because the F, there's an inverse, so I can take F inverse, right? So T F, T F inverse minus one belongs to compact. Because F F inverse is identity, is, is a constant function one, right? So T of constant function one is identity operator. So T of T of inverse minus one is compact according to what we proved in general. So this is a compact operator. So what does it mean? It means that T of multiplied by another operator is equal to compact perturbation of identity. So it means that T of is spread on by Atkinson's term, right? That's what we proved. Okay, so this by itself shows that there again you mean compact on H2, right? Not on H2. Uh, on H2, exactly, H2, exactly. Yes. Right? Very good. Right. Uh, on this Hilbert space that we are working on right now, on the Hardy space, uh, exactly. So it shows that TF is invertible modulo compact. Uh, so Atkinson implies that um, TF is better. Uh, by the way, this F is called the symbol of the operator. F is a first example for us of symbol of an operator. It's a symbol of TF, whatever symbol means. I mean, well, symbol is the, the original function, commutative object you start with and turn it into some quantum mechanical non-commutative object. Uh, the original one is called symbol, and this is the operator of that. 
defined by that symbol, but uh, anyhow. So. so what this result shows is that if, as soon as the symbol is an invertible operator, uh, sorry, invertible function, the operator is fertile. That's what uh, we have so far. Okay. So you see, uh, this statement uh, makes uh, sense on purely algebraic level, but we can never prove this using pure algebra, stuff that we did in the first lecture. It's very difficult, I don't see how really, you have this, a topless matrix and to show that this, is, this defines a threat operator. I just, just don't see how to do it. But the, the tools that we developed in the last two lectures uh, exactly helps us. Okay, so now this is spread home, so the question is what is the index of this guy, right? And that's where um, we are heading. Any questions or comments? Okay, so the, the the answer to this question is the uh, this theorem. Uh, it's actually due to um, Fritz Noder. He is the brother of Emmy Noder. Fritz Noder. Uh, Nineteen twenty, actually, it's quite early on. Is that uh, for? F belonging C of S1 invertible, uh, index of TF is equal to minus winding number of F on C. Okay. So people say this is the very first index theorem. Uh, uh, okay, really, um, I don't know. I also think of uh, gauss bonnet theorem as the very first index theorem. Sometimes I think of uh, the, the theorem that sums of angles of a triangle in, uh, in Euclidean space uh, is 180 degree as the first index theorem that goes back to Euclid. So that's, uh, that depends on how far you want to push uh, your dates or what you exactly mean, really. Uh, so this is, uh, this is very, very interesting uh, uh, index theorem. By, um, actually, the, the abstract index might very well have been defined by, by, by Fritz Noder himself in this uh, mathematician Allen paper in 1920, 21. I think it's 20. Um, okay, so um, how do you prove this now? Well, I mean, uh, what is, um, you just uh, look at both sides. Both sides are integer valued, right? Uh, won't this follow from homotopy invariance? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, indeed, R integer valued. Um, so um, suffices uh, and are uh, homotopy invariant. Right. So in other words, if you have a continuous pass of functions in the invertibles connecting one to the other, the winding number is actually, in fact, it's, it's, the, it's defined that way, is, uh, is homotopy variance of this uh, phi one. Um, so so um, let me write a little bit. So this, we are using the following facts. Pi one of C star, which is C minus zero and one is, Z and sending class of F into winding number of 
F at zero is the isomorphism. Right? And on the left hand side, we just have uh, this index from Fraton operators into Z that we discussed. So to prove this suffices to prove it on, on, the, on, on the generator of, uh, of um, um, and since and now I can say, so, so let me write it down. So suffices. Move it for f of z equal to zn. To prove it for f of z equal to zn and belonging to um, and belonging to z z. But in fact, I'm saying it suffices to prove it for n equal to one. Can you tell me why is it enough to prove it for n equal to one? By multiplicativity of the n. By multiplicativity, exactly. So um, if you um, if you multiply, then you add the uh, indices. Yeah, so right hand side certainly, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be additive, uh, is an additive function in, in, in n. Now, the left hand side, if I look at t of zn, uh, we can write it as t of zn is not t of z to the power of n, or maybe it is actually t of zn is t of z to the power n. So using uh, Additivity of index or multiplicity of index on the left hand side and this winding number on the right hand side, you can just reduce mm -hmm. it to case n equal to one. But in fact, you don't need even to do that. You can just directly check in this case. So let me check it for n equal to one. So for n equal to one, this uh, TF Z. So uh, what is Tz? Uh, if you look at Tz, you remember the matrix of Tz? Uh, how does it uh, look like? Uh, so we have the zero, zero, zeros. And here we, we have got um, zeros also, all, all the way is here, here zero. Here is one, okay? So this Tz of, um, of one is equal to z, tz of z is equal to z2, and tz of zk is equal to z k plus one. So this operator, you know, well, what is this operator? It's a shift operator, right? Now, um, this operator is uh, injective, so dimension of kernel, equal to zero dimension of co kernel uh, it's it reaches everything except uh, constant function one so it's equal to one so index is equal to minus one and that's exactly the winding number of z multiplied by minus one so this minus one is also important You can do similarly for all uh, Z powers directly without invoking this multiplicative property of the index or winding number, but uh, you can just do that. Okay. So this is uh, in one form or the other is in uh, Noder's, uh, Fritz Noder's paper, um, the first one. Any questions or comments? So, uh, just like a slightly different question. What do we know about the uh, uh, commutator of these toplet operators? TFTG minus TFTG. Is yeah, yeah. TF, TFTG oh. minus TGTF. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah, right. Well, that, that's an interesting object. I think I will go back to that. Uh, um, yeah, I think if F and G are smooth functions, maybe C1, C2, something like that, that's uh, actually, it turns out to be trace class. And taking trace of those commutators gives you interesting uh, co-cycles on, uh, on, on, on this topless uh, algebra, algebra. So I will go back to that. So that, that's an interesting question. Um, TF, commutator of TFTG, um, I think you can show that it's actually more than uh, compact. It's trace class operators if F and G are smooth. And then if you take the trace, you get interesting objects, mm -hmm. uh, chromological objects. Yeah. I think I will, I will discuss that uh, soon. Yeah, because I was just thinking, so TFT, commutator of TFTG is an index uh, zero object inside uh, the Fred home. Oh, be, be, be careful. If F and G are uh, invertible, uh, but if they are not invertible, then they, this is not the They're not true, true. So if they're invertible, then you, these are all uh, index zero uh, objects inside Fred zero of H2. Yeah. I was thinking whether it generates the whole connected component. No, no, it doesn't. But they are, they are of interest, uh, not of, because uh, they are Fred home, actually they are of interest because they, they, these commutators are if F and G are smooth, for example, or trace class, then you can take the trace. So they're compact actually, but better than compact, they're trace. So you can take trace. And those traces are interesting uh, objects. Okay. These are non-commutative integration, basically, some sort of non-commutative. Mm -hmm. We will look at that actually, once uh, we have, um, but um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question, right. Um, any other questions or comments? But now, I mean, so toplets operators, so this, is sto this story is just the beginning of the sea of results. Uh, so you can extend this in many, many different directions. And these are all very interesting. Um, um, I mean, there is index theorem for topless operators on pseudo convex domains in general, on Kähler manifolds on general, in general. Uh, there are generalizations of this result that I just unfortunately raised in many, many directions. So I hope we can look at some of those. But so let me start uh, by. Uh, mentioning one of them, uh, so sorry. I wanna keep track of time. Oh, we are already um, just um, one hour, 40 minutes, so I should finish soon. Can I, can I, can I continue for 10 more minutes maybe, or just to give some, uh, I have further generalizations. So, um, so toplets, uh, index theorem has many generalizations. They're all very interesting actually. So let me look at this case. First of all, we can look at um, L2 of S1 and Cn. So um, we can look at functions on the circle, uh, vector valued functions on the circle, right? Uh, functions. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, in fact, uh, these are L2 sections of a trivial bundle on a swan. You can think of it. Uh, you go like that. Okay, so now uh, we have analogs of uh, H. And so this is our H. So I call it HN. And we have uh, this HN2. Um, so this is uh, the set of all, um, you can think of it, the set of all uh, vector valued functions whose um, negative uh, Fourier coefficients of all components are zero, right? Uh, such that, uh, okay, so let me put it like this. Obviously this Hn is equal to H tensor Cn, right? Well, H is L2 of S1, right? So this is this. And Hn2, I can take H2 tensor C. Okay. H2, this is, so this is the hardest space. Okay, now what we did, you can repeat. For any f, actually from uh, S1 to GLN C. Now remember this, of course, recall that this GLN C is the space of m by n invertible matrices, right? For any function, uh, this uh, continues. I mean, you don't even have to go to GLNC. So I, you, you just go to, uh, sorry, to n by n matrices actually, to n of c. Uh, you can take this toplitz uh, operator tf again, p and f p as before. Well, what is mf? mf is, um, you see, mf. G is uh, now this F and G are on different levels. We have to be careful. So maybe I just call this phi because this is more related to symbols. So I call it phi, right? So M phi. So what is M phi? M phi G is just, uh, you just have this matrix and multiply by this column uh, vector valued function, right? So this is, uh, so this is phi and this is g. You just uh, acting uh, point wise by matrix multiplication on, on, on this column matrices, right? So that's this one. And the p is of course projection onto HN2. So uh, t phi is this one. And uh, one can show that uh, this actually, uh, if phi now goes from S1 to uh, GLNC is invertible, this T phi is threshold. The proof is similar to what we did. Uh, there's not any new ideas involved. All, all, the, all the results that we proved is there. And now, so the question is, what is the index of this? Okay. So you expect by the case of n equal to one that um, the index should depend somehow, uh, should depend on some topological information on T phi, because this guy is homotopy invariant. So if you change phi in a homotopic way inside this is space of maps, continuous maps from S1 to M N of C, uh, this guy shouldn't change, right? This index should not change. So it should just depend on homotopy class of this map, right? So, of course, this map is what 
basically defines pi one of, I mean, this map is what defines pi one of GLNC, right? This is relevant here. So I, I'm going to write uh, down the, the result. Uh, there's a formula, and this formula is uh, our second example. This is the, the, to Goldberg and Krein in, again, basic, simple, baby examples, but kind of illuminating, actually. So this is a term. So this is uh, Goldberg Krein. I believe this is in 1950s. Uh, I have seen it also attributed, I'm not so sure, but it's, it's attributed to Wiener and Hoff as well. Norbert Wiener and Hoff, uh, but um, maybe, I, I guess I read somewhere that they were developed in uh, during the Second World War as a part of this uh, Wiener's project in war effort in the US. They were developing radars and stuff like that. So these sort of operators became important. I don't know uh, the, the history of this really. But the, the term is this. Uh, the term is that, in fact, index of uh, T5 is equal to minus winding number of what? Can you tell me? So we have, a, we have a pass of matrices, invertible matrices. So it goes from a swan into a space of invertible matrices, goes there and comes back again to identity somewhere. Uh, maybe taking uh, uh, trace or determinant and then taking winding down. Trace, is, it won't work because trace could be zero, but determinant in fact is the correct answer, yeah. Determinant of phi and uh, identity. So proof, I say, is an exercise. I think you need to know what is pi one of GLNC. I think uh, I believe it is Z, but I'm not sure. Um, I didn't think about it. Um, it's a good idea to think about pi one. You, you can compute it, that's not a problem. Um, so let me just, um, this, is, this is the exercise. I think it, it's a good exercise. Um, but let me give you an example that convinces you that this is actually, this is something perhaps it's true, it's not so wild. And the reason is this, um, let me check it for phi to be just diagonal, right? How about checking in that case? Phi to be uh, diagonal, uh, phi one, phi two, phi n zero, zero. So it's just a diagonal matrix, right? If it is diagonal, then uh, what? Then of course, in this case, T5 is uh, T5 one, T5 two, T5 n, right? And in that case, index of T5, is sums of indices of uh, T phi i. Right? And uh, now on the other hand, if you look at determinant, it's just a product of these things, right? So what is the winding number of these products? Products of these functions, uh, complex valued invertible function. Uh, winding number of product of functions is sums of winding numbers.
So we can use this uh, Noder's uh, index theorem uh, to drive this uh, Gober prime from that case. So you have checked it at least in this case. So perhaps one can give a proof in this case by showing that any map can be made homotope to such diagonal maps and then we are okay. But uh, okay, I don't want to commit myself to yes or no at this stage. So, but but this is a this is a true theorem due to this gentleman Goheri and Klein from 1950s and maybe Wiener and Hopf also. So we have seen two cases. Um, you can do, as I said, um, toplitz operators over odd spheres. You can do it over tori, because you see S1 can be generalized into so many things, right? You can generalize into SN, you can generalize into TN, you can generalize into, uh, into a lot, a lot of things. So um, it goes into, as I said, compact Keller manifolds, uh, holomorphic bundles on them, and uh, into super convex domains. We will see some of those index theorems later on. Um, okay, so I think we are done for now. So um, one thing I should mention is that this uh, by itself won't follow, in this case or that case, or won't follow from a single index theorem because a single index theorem is an, is an index theorem about even dimensional, only has content in the even dimensional case. These are odd index theorems. So if you prove odd index theorem from a single index theorem, which is not such a trivial thing to do, you may be able to drive these results as a special case. But in general, uh, this has a different flavor. Uh, okay, so um, any questions or comments? We are done for today's lecture. So uh, one way I was just thinking, so your uh, pi, pi one of GLNC. Right. We can try to show that, so GLNC will retract onto its maximal compact subgroup UN. And then you need to show pi one of UN. And then you have the fibration UN, UN minus one, UN quotiented by UN minus one, which is an SM. Okay. No, sorry, sorry. No, you have the determinant map. I think you have UN determinant yeah. to U1 with uh, 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 fiber un minus one. And then inductively you just show it z because you know you pi one of u1 is z. Okay, yeah, so that's good. Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, we have to write it down. So if you come to my office, we will work it together. Why don't you do that? Yeah. <laughs> sure. no, I, think, I, think, I think I like to see, uh, to see it completely written. I, I believe uh, it's along those lines. We should use some, uh, some homotopy calculations, which is elementary, of course. I mean, it's no, no, so the retraction onto compact subgroup, that is fine, right? That will retract onto yeah, one. I believe so, right. So, or, therefore, uh, you have homotopy invariance there. So, you just need to calculate pi one of un. Yeah, pi one of U, un is, it's, um, I mean, no, pi one so of is not. Look at determinant map. Yeah, then just look at determinant map to u1. Pi one of u n is uh, is z n right? Because no, it's, it's just that. It's no, 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 no. U n. Sorry, I said no, no. It's it's mm. not torus. I was thinking about torus. No, u n. No, no. It's it's z right? So determinant. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You just look at determinant map to u one. Mm -hmm. Then look at fiber, which is a u n minus one. Okay. Uh -huh. And then inductively, you just get. Uh, uh, pi one of u n in terms of pi uh, pi one of u n minus one, and then you know pi one of u one is that. Yeah, so, so yeah, along those lines, I'm sure it works, right? I I I I, I totally agree, right? But this mm -hmm. is a nice uh, example in this case. So this is a second. Uh, that's the, that's the first generalization of this Noether's index theorem, uh, and then we'll see many other generalizations. Okay. So any other questions or comments? Okay, so let me stop the video then.